between now and Christmas, uh, I'm going to be uh, speaking to you from the scriptures and what is given to us there in the life of David, the life of David. Uh, and David is a man described in the Word of God with striking superlatives. Acts 13, 22 says, He raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. He will do all my will. Wow. Elsewhere, the Lord, speaking to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, says, 1 Kings 14, 8, You have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. You can be sure there is plenty for you and for me to learn from a man such as this. And the scriptures give us more insight, I think more insight into David's personal relationship with God than we get about anyone else with the exceptions of the Lord Jesus himself and maybe the apostle Paul. His story begins in the middle of 1 Samuel chapter 16. So that's going to be our focus today. By the way, we forgot to mention the green attendance registers are found on the far left side of your row. If you're seated there and you haven't passed it yet, take care of that for us. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm reading from the New Living Translation for the simple reason that I like it on this passage. And it says in verse 1, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil, he's speaking to Samuel again, and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. <laughs> now, the date for this would be what? Well, let's get you, uh, let's get you acquainted with the, some of these stories and how they fall in biblical history. The Exodus, 1280 B.C., the period of the judges from around 1220 to 1050. King Saul reigned from roughly 1048 to 1010. And then the rule of David, as you see coming after that, 1010 to 970. Well, let's read on. The Lord said to Samuel, you've mourned long enough. I've rejected Saul as king. Go to the house of Jesse. One of his sons will be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice for the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. So now we meet the family of David, fathered by Jesse. We don't know much about Jesse. He apparently is a middle-class sheep rancher. David's great-grandparents were Boaz and Ruth of biblical fame, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 12. Boaz became the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of Eliab, his firstborn, then Abinadab, Shimei, all these other guys, David the seventh. And there were sisters too, and the three sons of Zariah and so forth mentioned in that passage. It's possible that David's mother was a woman named Nahash, but we really aren't sure about the name of David's mother. Twice, David makes reference to his mother in the Psalms, giving indication that she was a godly woman who loved and served the Lord. So we read now what happened when Samuel arrived at the home of Jesse in Bethlehem. Verse 6, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimei, but Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. 
Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Well, that's a great story. So let's talk about the important lessons here. And I've only got two. First is this. God sovereignly chose and called David. God sovereignly, unilaterally, chose and called David. That could be said of every biblical leader. No one earned a place as a leader for the Lord. In fact, no one even volunteered, really. God just looked down on the earth, and he plucked up a man here and a man there, a woman here and a woman there to use for his purposes. It was God who sovereignly called Noah to build him an ark. He called Abraham to leave his homeland. He called Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. Jeremiah was a boy. God called him. Amos was a fig nipper. That's what he called himself. God made him a prophet. God chose and called Saul of Tarsus, very unlikely choice. He called Mother Mary. He, in every instance, our God is the initiator. He is the electing and the choosing God. The Jews, as an entire nation, were called God's chosen people. I remember being in a college class when... Uh, we were talking about the idea of the Jewish nation as the chosen people of God, and there was a Jewish student in there, a female, uh, who said, oh, that whole business about the Jews being God's chosen people really means that the Jews chose God, not the other way around. Uh, and I'm listening to that thinking, I'm pretty sure that's not how the language works here. That turns the language of Scripture on its head and the worldview of Scripture as well. God is the great chooser. Jesus chose his followers. He didn't open up a booth one day on the Sea of Galilee and take uh, applications. He went to guys and said, you, you follow me. John 15, verse 6, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. So God affirms here. He says, I have selected you. Saul was, in a sense, a king for the Jewish people. David was going to be a king for God. 1 Samuel 13, the Lord speaks to Saul. Verse 4, now your kingdom shall not endure. This is to Saul. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has appointed him as a ruler over his people. And you'll notice again the subject of the verbs. The Lord has sought out and the Lord has uh, appointed. This brought to my remembrance my own story as, as a pastor. I've been lead pastor uh, of a church for over 36 years, but two churches. And in neither case did I apply for the positions, even though I was aware of the openings, but I did not initially offer myself to be a pastor of either church, but thankfully, my Lord overrules and appoints and calls. Do you know that that's what God has done for you? If you are a child of God today, if you are a lover of Jesus Christ, if you can enter into this worship today with a full heart, it is because God sought you and God appointed you to this exalted place of being his son and his daughter. Now, David apparently knew this. He understood it. He could have missed it. He could have come to think that, oh, it was his great musical abilities that got him noticed, or it was his great military prowess, especially in the Goliath episode. Why, if anybody earned his stripes to become king, it was David. But this man knew that his position and his status among men was by God's choosing, God's doing. That, that's so important to remember if you are in a leadership role. You may come to wonder, how did I get here? <laughs> uh, others will wonder that for you, by the way. They'll wonder, how did he get that job? Yeah. <laughs> They'll question you. And it is a great comfort and a great strength to know that I am in this position because God himself called me. 
You know the part of David's story when they uh, brought the ark into Jerusalem, they had established Jerusalem as the new capital, and they brought the ark of the covenant into the city, and they had a big celebration and a parade, and David went out and danced exuberantly in the parade, and then he goes home, and his wife, Michael, is waiting there for him with scorn in her heart, and she said that he was not, he was not appropriately modest, uh, in the parade and the dancing, and he was not presidential, and he embarrassed himself and apparently his wife. Listen to David's reply, 2 Samuel 6, verse 21. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord, who chose me above your father. I don't know if there's a little dig there or what, but he said, he chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So... I celebrate before the Lord. And then in 2 Samuel 7, after hearing from God about the future kingdom of David's sons, he just is blown away, and he says this, verse 18, David the king went in, sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you have brought me this far and yet this was insignificant in your eyes. O oh, Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future, and this is the custom of man, O oh, Lord God. Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O oh, Lord God, for the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done this. So David asks the why me question. And it's not, why did these terrible things happen to me? It's why have I been so privileged and blessed? Why did God choose David? And who can answer that? <laughs> what is the basis of God's choosing? The Bible offers no real answer to that. We assume he has a basis. We're just not privy to it. So Romans 9, 15 said, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, I will show compassion to anyone I choose, and he doesn't seem to want to explain himself. Sometimes the Lord seems to go out of his way to choose the weak and the least. Among Jesse's sons, he chose the youngest, apparently the last one that Jesse thought was going to be uh, chosen or selected for this honor. He chose Jacob, the younger brother, not the older brother, the younger brother of Esau. He chose Israel, one of the least of the nations of the earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the apostle says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things this world considers foolish in order to shame those who think that they are wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those that are powerful. But, 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 God also chose, God also used the great and the brilliant and the powerful. What is God's basis for his calling and electing? We don't know. <laughs> and David didn't know either. But let no man boast before the Lord. He alone sovereignly calls, sovereignly chooses, praise his holy name. All right, second thing that we note from 1 Samuel 16 is the priority of the inward over the outward. The priority of the inward over the outward, this uh, comes up in verses 6 and 7, way back in 1 Samuel 16. David took one look at Eliab, the older brother, and saw, surely this is the Lord's anointed. We don't get a picture. Don't you wish at times in the Bible you wish they had uh, illustrations, photographs, give us a picture of what Eliab was looking like. He must have been a nice, tall, good-looking guy. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. King Saul had beaten everybody in outward impressiveness. He was taller, it said a head taller than everybody else in the land, uh, but he was a flop in God's eyes. Outward impressiveness, good looks, mean nothing in the eyes of God. Now, this is not to suggest that David was a puny, ugly squirt. No, no. He was probably uh, a little on the short side, but he was handsome. Verse 12 tells us that. So, hey... It's okay to be good-looking. 
Aren't you relieved? <laughs> I, I know I am. Uh, but truly, David had a lot going for him. He had good looks. He had musical ability. He had physical strength. He was good with a slingshot. Still, he was described as a man after God's heart. He had both the outward and the inward. But what really counted? What draws the commentary of the Lord? What mattered before God was his heart. And David seemed to grasp that. You read the Psalms and you see what concerned David. It was the concerns of his soul. There are plenty of physically and outwardly impressive people, athletes, musicians, actors, who work to do what they do and do it well. The athlete strives to improve his body and increase his skill. But if he's a lover of Christ, his deepest concern is always going to be the state of his heart. The preacher wants to do his best in his work. He devises good sermons. He makes wise leadership decisions. But what matters most, again, is the state of the pastor's heart, that which man may never see, but God sees. And in truth, who really knows you? Is it not God alone? All we see, even if we live in your house, all we see is your appearance. Now, now certainly there is a connection between the inward and, and the outward. Sometimes our outer person gives away things about our inner condition. Sometimes that's the case. But the appearance often fools us. Have you not been fooled plenty of times by those who looked good, sounded good, but later proved to be otherwise? And haven't you thought poorly of people when you first got to know them, but eventually you came to admire them? We can only know each other so well. God looks on the heart. He is the one who really knows you. And I don't know about you, but it's his approval that I desire. And God places priority on the inward, not the outward. So what does that mean for your life? What do you give attention to? What do you work on? The outside? The physical? Our, our society, you know, we're fanatical about improving the outward and the physical. We pay out, out billions of dollars for our exercise programs and our gym memberships and our sports equipment and our health foods and our cosmetics and our cosmetics and more cosmetics and clothes and jewelry and decorations. We desperately want to look good. We want to impress. Impress whom? <laughs> impress whom? Spoke to the kids in Blackburn Monday about this very question. Who do you want to impress? And the person that you want to impress or the people you want to impress, boy, that will shape almost everything about you. Who do you want to impress? God doesn't focus on those external things. I'm not saying God favors the out of shape and the unkempt and the unattractive. No particular favor in that direction either, but let's get our values in line with his. How much time, how much money do you spend improving the outward you as opposed to how much attention you give to the inward you? <laughs> so Jesus spoke to the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 23 Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which, appear outside, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. When you come to church, you take time to put on your makeup, to fix your hair, <coughs> to dress up nice. There is some value to that. There is. But what are you doing to prepare your heart to worship God, to engage with Him? Stephen Charnock, in his quaint Puritan way, put it this way, is our diligence greater to put our hearts in an adoring posture than our bodies in decent garb? Or are we content to have a muddy heart so that we might have a dressed carcass? It's an interesting way to put it. Carcass is looking good today, Bob, you know. <laughs> That's all it is. What I am saying is put so well in Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence. Your what? Your heart. For from it flow the springs of life. Go ahead and fix your hair, shine your shoes, polish your nails, 
develop your skills. Those things are good in their place, but never forget that the eyes of God see through it all, and they see straight to your heart. David had skill. David apparently was nice looking. He had strength. But what made him great in God's eyes was a heart that longed to walk in the paths of righteousness and live by the commandments of his king. The lesson David learned, the lesson Samuel learned, the lesson we must learn is the priority of the inward over the outward. David, of course, was a very flawed representative of the one who will be ultimately the son of David in the first century version, the perfect king, the anointed one, and the ultimate and perfect man after God's own heart. The Lord Jesus actually said this, John chapter 8, verse 29, He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And this is why the Father said of Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And since you and I have displeased the Father, since you and I have had a heart less than fully committed to Him, we be wise to put our faith in the Son of God, the beloved of the Father, in whom He is well pleased. We attach ourselves to Him with full assurance that our faith connection with Jesus, it will gain us entrance into His glory. It will gain us entrance into the joy of the one who is David's king and ours as well. So ponder that as we commit this to the Lord in prayer. Father, we who know you are blessed to remember that it is your sovereign choice, your benevolent choice, your inscrutable, merciful decision to reach down and pluck us up and make us yours. And we are astonished and blown away when we ponder that. Fill us with deep gratitude and overflowing cups as we contemplate your sovereign mercy to make us your sons and your daughters, and in some cases to put us in the places of leadership and responsibility and where, where we represent you. What a gift, what a privilege. All of that is, and it comes from your hand, and we thank you. And Lord, we thank you for the lesson that we read here about what your heart values. And we pray that you would conform our thinking and our values to that of our Savior, that we would value everything and everyone as he, as he does, and that we would come to put the preeminence and the priority upon the matters of the heart. Take our heart, make it yours, and make it like the heart of our Savior Jesus. We are thankful for Him and attach ourselves to Him anew that we might experience your benediction as our Father who is well pleased with your Son and with all who find themselves in him. And we pray in his name. Amen.